Top of the morning, lads and ladies. Support for the Off the Irish podcast is now brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below the waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels, and you no longer need the look of the Irish with the ladies. When I tell you this is premium, <laughs> I mean premium. The battery will last up to 90 minutes, so you can take a longer shave. The third generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents with their advanced skin safe technology pioneered by Manscaped. Get 20% off free shipping with the code IRISHPOD at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code IRISHPOD. Use the right tools and jobs to trim your pan potatoes. And welcome back. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Rob Nelson. How about you? Tell me about yourself. All right. Um, yeah, my name is Rob Nelson. I'm a biologist and filmmaker, and I make lots of different films, both on TV and on the internet. Well, thanks for joining me today, Rob. I very much appreciate it. Yeah, uh, I found you through your YouTube channel, Stone oh, Edge Yeah. Uh, tell me why you started to, start, to, start, to start that up. Well, I started uh, making films a long time ago. Uh, we, for about 12 years, we made films under the name of Untamed Science because the idea was let's, let's uh, show the fun side of science. I always found that teaching science was, was for the kids that enjoyed science already, but not for the kids at the back of the class or who were into sports. And so we always did that first. But more recently, I've, I've just noticed this interesting trend where there's this this creep of anxiety and depression and nihilism that seems to be dominant in the culture and i wasn't addressing any of that in let's just make science fun so i wanted to kind of hit on more of the human side of science you know what are the practical applications of reconnecting with nature right and so stone age man is that it's let's understand how we as a people used to live you know how did we evolve as a, as a people and what are we now missing like what can we take from from our knowledge in the past and use today and because i started studied biology like i'm a biologist not a psychologist you know i i bring a lot of my wildlife knowledge and we just try to i i try to provide a platform where people can learn about nature in a fun way that's the idea the stone age man that's a really cool idea, especially for the time we live. But I, I took biology and chemistry for the Leaving Cert, and I got, I got on all right in biology. I found it interesting and fun enough, but uh, <laughs> I struggle to stay awake <laughs> in chemistry. It is. <laughs> it's, an, it's an interesting trend where I think uh, biology teachers in general are teach a more fun class because they mm. have the ability to kind of just make it fun and let's learn about animals and stuff but you know that's not every teacher mm. uh, chemistry is interesting and, and math too because um people i think forget that chemistry and math is understanding the natural world too yeah but they take out the fun let's let's see how this or that works and the practical examples and it's all about memorizing formulas and it's no fun <laughs> Yeah, s sitting through, you know, eight weeks of organic chemistry for, mm -hmm. you know, an hour and a half, nearly, you know, three times a week is <laughs> learning. No. How it's, I, I, it's, totally it's it. I totally get it. I totally get it. Especially when my passion to take chemistry was watching Breaking Bad. It's not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, and that's, I think. I think if people were to recenter education on the practical application of like, why would you learn it? And that's, that's what Breaking Bad is, right? It's how can you create drugs? <laughs> and so like, why would you need to understand chemistry? Maybe, maybe that's an incentive for people. Although, you know, I wouldn't center it around how to create meth. That would be. No, I wanted the, uh, but, you know, the knowledge. But there's other ways that you can do it. I have a, an uncle, he's a lecturer in a college in Liverpool, I believe. But uh, he tells me the whole time that whenever he gets bored, he'll just give his students the formula to make meth just for like a fun, you know, not, I would, I'm not going to say practical class because, pra <laughs> but, you know, yeah. it's interesting, you know, it's yeah, well, it's, it more fun. Yeah, that makes sense. 
I, I agree with that approach. That's what I'm doing here. <laughs> Just in a yeah. different world. <laughs> <laughs> I really like the way your YouTube channel tries to teach people as well as, you know, you making content. You, this is your career, your job. It's, it's really good. Yeah, thanks. You know, I try, um, you know, this is not the approach of a lot of YouTubers that I know, or maybe I should just say science communicators, because a lot of YouTubers do do this. Um, but it's, uh, I like to just show my actual life. So many people are so filtered online, I feel like, you know, I know a lot of these science communicators. And their real life is nothing like what they portray. And I, I would hope that what I'm portraying is actually kind of my real life. It's not like, I live a, a glamorous life, but I could portray it that way. Yeah. I'm just, you know, getting by and, uh, yeah, trying to make ends meet. Yeah. I really enjoyed your, your Leap of Faith video. I think you got to talk about all the high points and kind of low points, a couple of your low points in your life. That was really mm. interesting. Gave us a really good insight into the character that you are kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that. You know, it's, um, I think in society today still, it's changing. We're not really, as men, we're not really told that it's okay to talk about some of the downtimes. Like I think we're always told you just gotta be strong and like fight through it. I know that when I grew up, that's kind of how, how I was raised. And I'm, I'm a pretty confident person in general and I've had very few low points, which I would even describe as maybe having little bits of depression. But I think it's it's useful to note that it's natural and almost everyone goes through it. That's like the normal state of being. And you, you'll, you know, you get more of it as you get older because yeah. it kind of fluctuates with how you see yourself in the world. But, um, you know, an interesting thing happened a few years back. I made a video about depression and not when I was in it. Like I had a little six month period where I felt like it was pointless, all the work that I was doing and I kind of had a low point. So I made a video about depression for, as a filmmaker and I put it out there and so many people responded to it positively. Like it was really surprising. I was kind of worried about putting this video out. And then what happened is my dad approached me and he said, you know, son, that's, I've been fighting chronic depression my whole life. You know, and I'm, I was 35 and my dad came up and told me that and it, I had no idea because he never talked about it ever. In fact, quite the opposite. He made me feel like talking about depression was all in my head and that I just need to think my way out of it and just think positively and it'll be gone. You know, it is not. And again, a lot of this was uh, stuff that, you know, maybe my wife was dealing with and he kind of almost shamed me for even thinking about it as if it was a real thing. And so then it was, it was so weird to hear him say he's been dealing with it his whole life, but just never would talk about it. So I think that kind of was my realization that it's useful to talk about these things. Um, and that's why, that's why I bring them up in a, a few of the videos I did, you know, like the Leap of Faith video, for instance. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Movember is out in the US. I know we did it over here and we raised about like, I think it was a million for men's mental health. Mm -hmm. just like you don't shave your mustache for like a month and you donate mm -hmm. money i don't know if it's a u.s thing but we do it over uh, there. well it's it's uh there it's i think creeping into the u.s a little bit i don't think everybody knows fully what it's all about um except that you they see people with mustaches online <laughs> <laughs> no but it's a really good thing that we do every year and it's really good idea to talk up, up about you know mental health and depression and you know yeah, I mean, I, I think I think a lot of people just don't even know how to talk about it. So mm -hmm. at least having it occasionally pop up and, and hopefully, you know, having uh, good male role models talking about it is useful too, because I feel like a lot of times when you see it, it's, um, you know, uh, well, it, it's just not that. <laughs> no. Yeah. And so if you, if you were, if, if you kind of are looking up to a male role model and you're not seeing that person talking about it then you'll feel like oh well that's not the route i want to go but yeah, yeah. It's that's the thing it's normal every literally everyone goes through it from 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 now back into history everyone <laughs> has dealt with it. it's part of what makes us human oh, you yeah. know if we didn't get stressed and worry about the future then we would be a different different species <laughs> yeah i find it quite hard 
Um, so during the first part of our first lockdown, I was studying for my leaving cert, which is like your your final exams for I think I think it's high school. I'm not sure yeah. what the okay. equivalent is, yeah. but uh, okay. yeah, we, we were told it was being postponed. It was happening. We were told mm-hmm. to keep studying. It's pretty tough. We were doing it all from home, you know. And yeah. um, then about two months into it, they cancelled it, and I had like nothing to do. So I was just kind of bored out of my head. I had no one to talk to, and that's when me and the two lads decided we'd do the podcast together just to give us something to do and then it was the three of us chatting every single day chatting to people we didn't think we'd ever get the opportunity to meet or talk to you know it was such a well it's 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 such a good thing to do it was so so a lot of what i think about now is how do we hijack what we used to do and use it today Mm. so having chats with people (laughs) it sounds so silly but it's like part of who we are and with this lockdown and everything it's like we can't have normal chat we can't go to the pub and just chat with people and so this is this is kind of a hijack right you're you're um taking something that's modern but using it to how we're well adapted i think i think it's great that you guys are doing this and to be honest with you uh i enjoy it as well because i'm also just stuck in my studio so it's nice to have little random chats here or there that's it's good and i bet a lot of the people that you get on the podcast too are um it's just nice to chat with people so yeah yeah a lot a lot of them say thank thank you so much for doing this i just you know i just needed something to take my mind off of covid it just we're going back we're just out of a a month-long lockdown and not even a week later we're going back we're going back into one like another really we, is that just that people is, is is there needs to be like a critical mass of people that actually are yeah. staying locked down and it just didn't happen or something so so we, our first lockdown was pretty bad i think the highest cases we saw were 800 900 which for a population of like 5 million that's pretty bad you can imagine and then we were out of it for maybe a month or two around august to October, mid October, and then we went back into one until December, where our highest cases were ranging from a thousand to a thousand five hundred. And then about a week ago, we came out of it where our cases were steadying at 200, 300. Mm -hmm. And then today, they're going to be announcing that there's going to be a thousand cases. You know, there was 700 yesterday. It is really bad over here. (laughs) I think. They come in on December 26th, so you can go see your family on Christmas, and then you're locked up until you get a vaccine, I think. Yeah, okay, yeah, well, um, well, at least you're chatting with people. Good yeah. job on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, uh, there's, there's so many things that kind of uh, are problematic. This lockdown is, is problematic. Not saying it's a bad thing, but, like, it's necessary in some ways. Mm-hmm. But um, it's not it doesn't help our psyche. I think another thing is seeing people online because I, I really feel like, you know, from understanding how we evolved as a species, a group size of about 300 is around the high end. So you're well adapted to find a way to mix into a small group of people, say 300, like in your school or yeah. something like that. And then you feel relatively content. Uh, working your way up the ladder, but when you open yourself up to the internet, you know, that's one of the things I find, you know, here now I'm not competing against the 300 people in my school anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm competing against 7 billion people. And I, (laughs) you know, someone once said, you know, say, say you live in New York city, New York city has a population of 25 million and you're, you're like high end, you're high performing. You're one in a million, as they would say, Mm -hmm. there are literally 20, 25 of you in that city. (laughs) Even though you're one in a million, there's 25 of you. Mm. You know, like, gosh. So it just kind of puts everything in perspective and uh, not not much you can do about it, but maybe just try to not worry about that part so much. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not, well, I've been doing, I just finished up college. I was doing it all online first semester. Just Okay, yeah. Um, I got to go in every Friday to do, I have to go in to do, stuff on computers that i didn't have access to here but uh it was fun getting to go in 
you know otherwise I, I just don't think I'd actually feel like a college student <laughs> just it's right well hopefully hopefully things will get back to normal and then you won't have to worry about it <laughs> yeah hopefully and then you can go back and tell everybody all the cool people you chatted oh yeah i, can't I don't necessarily put myself in that list but um i do enjoy chatting stop. it's wonderful to... <laughs> would you stop <laughs> <laughs> well you know it's funny because um i do chat i do chat with a lot of schools a lot of classes uh, it's a lot of interesting people but um a lot of people say that it's like there's so many things you've accomplished you should be so proud of it and i guess like looking at it from afar i can see how it would look like look like that but for me you know i'm in my own little bubble and i'm trying every day to like find out how to make things work and there's a little bit of a disconnect right now between perceived fame and uh, financial stability maybe i just put it that way because you know it's nice to just chat honestly um, you know, all of my friends who in school went into business or engineering or some sort of high paying career job, um, are very stable and they have huge homes. Um, and I've, uh, I've done kind of a different approach, which was, um, focusing around what I thought was most important to make the world better. Maybe put it that way, kind of a moral stance on how, how to live my life. Um, but that hasn't necessarily meant that, you know, I'm bringing in the dough because not every decision that I make is is about how to make the best, you know, how to make more money, mm -hmm. right? which is how everybody is trained to see the world. So, you know, I I make things work and I, I feel pretty lucky for my situation. But when I start comparing myself, that's when it's like it gets tricky. You know, I am still in the top one percent of people worldwide. Granted, you are too, probably, if you yeah. think worldwide, yeah. but still, <laughs> tricky. No, it's a, uh, it's a tough world. No, it's, it's yeah. Tricky. So tell me, tell me about um, what, what, because I'm curious. The whole leap of faith thing, you know, we we, we started into that a little bit. Yes. Um, what attracted you to that idea? And I, I can explain a little bit more about it, but um, yeah, what attracted you to that idea? Would you say? Um, I guess it was just your whole idea of just to have confidence in yourself that you kind of knew what you were doing and that if you wanted it bad enough, you could have it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Like you said, you wanted to go to Australia. You went to Australia. Mm -hmm. You said, you know, you wanted to start making documentaries and, you know, you funded your own, your first documentary. You traveled with those, uh, those lads across Mexico. Like that is ballsy, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting because there's a fine line between stupidity and what I would consider just saying a leap of faith, right? You know, like I, I have two kids now, six yeah. and nine, and I don't want to teach them to do stupid stuff, mm -hmm. right? Like I don't want to teach them to jump off of a building without having a plan or a, a basic understanding of how to roll out of it, yeah. you know? <laughs> Like you can do, you can do stuff that seems crazy to a lot of people, um, but you have to have one a little bit of preparation mm -hmm. and skill set behind you, and then, and then the leap of faith is kind of like I'm just going to trust that maybe this will happen, mm -hmm. and like because if you don't take the leap, you never get there. That's, that's part of the thing. I see so many people who, and I, I have kind of lived by this the philosophy that was in the video where I. Um, I take a lot of risks, so to speak. Um, and I see so many people who are not happy with their life as it is. Yeah. And so much of it is they almost never take a leap of faith. They almost never take a risk. They almost never take, step out of their comfort zone at all. You know what I like? I don't want to talk, talk badly about my brother because, um, well, he'll never watch this. Yeah, I just say this. My my brother is a, is a good example. Um, it he I think um, sees what I do as extremely risky, and um, and and not responsible. It's unfortunate, yeah, that I think that he sees it that way. But you know, he's taken a quite quite a different approach. He, he got a really well paying job, has four kids, does the nine to five, which is absolutely nothing wrong with it, but. You know, he told me this summer that he, he wasn't super happy with how, uh, with his job. He hated it. 
but I don't think he would ever want to take the risk to not do that, you know, yeah. so I, which is fine, but um, some, I, sometimes I just think people need a little bit of encouragement to take, take a, a risk and hopefully yeah. you can make your dream happen, knowing full well that you probably will fall flat a bunch of times. <laughs> That's important to note. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, I talk to a lot of, uh, you know, actors and entertainers and especially mm. in the entertainment business, it is, mm. I can see maybe where your brother's coming from with the whole risky thing, mm -hmm. just because uh, the marketing, is, the market is like ever changing. Like you put up a documentary about biology, which, you know, that's what you do that gets millions of views. And then you could put one up next month and it gets 10 K, you know, it's yeah. And YouTube yes. is such a new concept still. It's only like 10, 15, not even that, you know, how many years old it's people are making careers off it now. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. It, um, you know, my wife started out acting. She, she got a dual degree in biology and acting and then also kind of did a lot of uh, music at the same time. So she made kind of dual majors in choir and, and singing. So, so should we have a lot of friends that are actors. We have a lot of friends that are musicians. Uh, I now have a lot of friends who are filmmakers. So it's kind of in this, this interesting bubble of, like you were talking about entertainers. Um, it's so make or break, such a weird industry. You know, I, even for myself, uh, you know, I, in 2016, 17, yeah, that kind of period, and kind of into 2018, uh, I had a ton of TV gigs. I did 25 shows where I was hosting. And it, like in that period of time, it's just nonstop. And in fact, I had to turn down jobs because I, I was like, well, I'm, I'm on the road. I, I can't do, I can't do it. I know you want me to be a featured whatever. And then all of a sudden it just stopped. It was the weird thing. I don't know. Like, and, and I think partly what happens in the industry is the few people that are controlling the networks can get on this idea of this is what everybody wants. So at one point it's like, we want real scientists. So that's when everybody wanted me. And then all of a sudden it turned to like, we want um, actors to go out and do it. So we want celebrities yeah. out in the field. And then I wasn't there. So that was the trend. And then now I don't, I don't know what people want, like crazy people. <laughs> I think I think some there's a do you know like the Kardashians are on TV that got cancelled I think that's being replaced now by like a TikTok family show like how, how crazy is that like TikTok is two three years old and now they're getting major network television shows like pfft. yeah like it's unbelievable <laughs> well and it's I mean just points to the thing in entertainment you I I was upset about the fact that an executive could decide whether or not I had a career, you know, like I would, I could be like living, I loved TV. It was, it was actually fun to some degree. You know, I wasn't happy with all of the decisions that were made because I, I couldn't make all of the decisions, but I didn't like the idea that like you're watching your premiere, not knowing whether or not you're going to have a season two. You have yeah. to, like, we literally, have to make a backup plan that then could get canceled as soon as they're they green light the next series because they'll green light it and be like we got to start shooting in two weeks and then you have to cancel your whole schedule so like you can't create good relationships working relationships with other people outside of tv and then they can just snap their fingers and you uh, we were talking it's so, to, uh, it's not fun <laughs> we were That's why i like to YouTube a little bit but go ahead tell me yeah, YouTube's a bit better, like in that regard, because at least you control what you make and when it comes out and everything. Yeah, yeah. But we were talking to Dominic Berges. He's a great guy, great actor, and he was telling us he was doing, he was shooting for a television show, and he shot the premiere, like the the pilot episode, I guess you'd call it, and he was waiting for it. He was watching it as it came out, like it was being premiered and everything, and he noticed that he had been replaced. <laughs> with an entirely different actor who said all the same lines. Oh and... crap, really? <laughs> like, <laughs> that is, <laughs> he was, uh, it's, it's mad. Just that they have, the, you know, we didn't like that guy. Let's shoot the entire show again, but with a different guy. 
it's so weird how you know, people don't have an understanding of this and i <clears throat> you know the, what i do documentary is a little bit different field but yeah you would think that being the host of a show and literally saying the narration that you would have more control over what was presented <laughs> but you they don't even let you see the cut until it's done practically i mean some shows are a little better and they want to work with you a little bit more but um it de- a lot of shows like you don't see it until it airs and you just sit and you watch it and you're like and sometimes they don't even send you the cut like a lot of shows where i'm like a talking head so there's a show on science channel called blood on earth we do interviews for a whole day every every year and then that a lot of times they don't even send me the cut <laughs> so i don't even know how they cut up what i'm saying it's weird no <laughs> <But> it's <laughs> it's very weird let's uh let's move on because <laughs> Mm-hmm. Television's cool, but you know what's even cooler? Biology. Yeah. That's <laughs> let's right. talk about let's talk about your passion for it. Where did where did the whole passion you want to study biology come from? Um, I think probably a couple places, but it places, but it was always related to fish and water and particularly uh sp- spending time on on a lake. So my parents um had a lake house and <clears throat> it sounds probably like I was like really rich by saying that but we had like a little shack on the lake and we used to go down and fish all the time uh so it's not quite the like fancy lifestyle you imagine but i used to look in this little uh body of water with the lights as it would shine down into the water and just think like wow i wish i could understand what was happening under the water right and um i watched a lot of jack Cousteau. this was growing up when i was like 15 16 i ended up getting a bunch of fish tanks so i had five fish tanks in my room growing up one of which had a whole bunch of piranha. So I had this giant tank with a bunch of piranha in it. And um, that, was, that was pretty cool. And I ended up also uh, starting into doing a scuba diving um, course when I was 16. Kind of finished it all up when I was 17. Uh, and, and so I spent a lot of time like trying to understand all of this stuff and then went to school in Miami and joined the scuba club. And I just, I really loved the idea of underwater because it felt like an adventure, yeah. right? You can look out on the great blue ocean and know that if you, if you were to just drive out in a straight line and drop anchor anywhere, just a random spot, you might be the first person to ever see that little plot of underwater, you know? That's pretty cool. Yeah, no. <laughs> but like, there's a lot of people, like, this is very new to go down with scuba gear. And yeah, so I don't know. I just, I have found that really interesting. The idea, cause I always liked the idea of being an adventure and discovering something new. Mm. Um, and I think maybe that's also why I, I'm not doing actual science right at the moment because, or, or research, because it got so niche, you know, you'd have to like study one little thing. And I like to kind of look more broad and, and think of it more as an adventure. Yeah. It's a, uh, it is mad how much of the ocean that has, not been discovered yet like we we don't even know what's down there it's it's scary (laughs) did you did you see my video on the deep sea that i did a long time ago but i'm not sure i I saw a clip of you going scuba diving though so i this is just just kind of a a tidbit on what we were talking about we when i was in honduras visiting haley's brother so in rotan honduras little island in the um gulf of mexico there's a guy who built his own submarine that was on the island. And so we traded, like did a little barter thing for him. Um, and he took us down in the sub to 2000 feet. And it was cool, <laughs> like, sketchy. I think it was the scariest thing I've ever done because uh, I knew, once we got in the sub, it wasn't so scary, but going before, like it's this dude who built his own submarine out of like car parts and ran and he was he wasn't even an engineer he was like an earth history major or something <laughs> but knowing that if you got into trouble down there like you got hooked on a, a net or a piece of fishing line even um at 2,000 feet nobody would save you 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 know you have like I don't know you'd probably I think he probably has reserves for three days of air or something two, two three days of air it's not a whole lot of time but um the closest sub that could get to you was in Florida you know nobody's nobody is going to get to you <laughs> you're done you get stuck so that was a little scary 
you know, to trust this guy. That was a leap of faith right there. Yeah, oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> sure. Ooh, calculated risk. But. <laughs> that is, uh, wow. No, uh, yeah. <laughs> That is 100%. Yeah, well, and it's just to like go down onto the, what well, actually kind of what was cool is he considers himself an explorer. And the way he funds a lot of this stuff is what well, people pay him to go on the sub, but <laughs> it's, it's so weird. He goes down in this thing and there's, there's shells that are at the bottom, these very specialized uh, mollusks that are very rare because they're only in the deep sea. And he would grab a few of these every dive, especially with clients who would be cool with letting him do it. Mm. And then he'd sell them <laughs> for like thousands of like 10,000 a piece. Oh, wow. Insane. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, you can imagine if you have a, if you have a submarine and you're doing scientific research, you're not going to be collecting these mollusks for sale. Like yes. he's one of the few people that can do it. And people pay money apparently for that have a rare shell shell isn't that just just crazy to think about like somewhere in the world there's a guy who built his own submarine selling shells for 10 grand a piece like i know it's crazy <laughs> yeah i have another friend who who i had in uh grad school who now does deep sea diving dives to like 400 feet but in in oh, scuba wow. so he does mixed air stuff but the way he earned his money was he would go down to these depths and then scoop fish up and bag them and send them to aquariums, but he'd sell them for ten to fifteen thousand a piece too. So he'd go on a dive somewhere in the middle of the Pacific. So he'd like get on a sailboat with people, just hitch a ride with them, with mm -hmm. his scuba gear that he was really expensive, and then go jump off in the middle of this place. And it was a rare fish that nobody had in an aquarium, but he knew it was here. Mm -hmm. And then he would sell it. So I I was always amazed by those kind of people. <laughs> It's a little bit like entrepreneurial biology. Oh, yeah. You got to be careful with some of that stuff, like collecting and selling. So it's kind of, mm. you know, as long as it's just you, but if it, if everybody started doing it, it'd get dicey. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's, that's crazy. Uh, yeah. you'd, you'd never think of people doing that, uh, like making, be able to make a profit off of like that kind of stuff, you know, but like, yeah, and it's like they, they're kind of in a category on their own. I, I will say that because it, it's important to probably point out that selling endangered species, for instance, is a huge problem in the U.S. Like, I don't know if people realize that, but that's why uh, you can't have, say, native fish in the U.S. in your aquarium. It's, it's kind of a weird thing. Yeah, technically you're not allowed to. Or you can't have like a raccoon as a pet because then there would, it would create a trade so that maybe people would go out into the wild, collect them, and then try to sell them. So they tried to like kill the trade right away, which is a good thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's two sides of that. I just thought I'd point that out. If we, yeah. if someone's listening, it's like, oh, I'm going to go out and collect animals and start selling them. <laughs> it's some moral issues and some ethical issues that we should talk about. You know, like, I'll, all right, we can move on from that, but I just pointed I'll put it out. The, I'll put the scuba gear away then until I get the whole thing sorted <laughs> out. Then. But uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, just to uh, finish up, I saw on your Instagram you were advertising your book. Tell oh. us a bit about that. Yeah. Oh, I, I sold a, or I have a book. Please go online and buy it, everyone. Uh, you can get it on 1995 on. <laughs> now, I wrote a book called, uh, with my wife, called Mother Nature is Not Trying to Kill You. That's, that's the book right there. Um, it's, it's a pretty fun little book. Um, I should send you a copy. I'll get your address afterwards. Um, it's, it's a, just a little guidebook. So if you look on the back of my wall here, you probably can't see all of those books but those are all field guides because that's all I enjoy reading. This is learning about different wildlife. But you know, if I take any one of these guides <clears throat> and I pull it off my shelf and I open it up, this is most guides. Mm. It says, there's the plant. It's 18 centimeters long by, two, you know, it's so boring, but I enjoy like seeing the diversity. I like guides that have a little bit of story to them. Yeah. Something, so you're learning, but at the same time, it's enjoyable. So that's, that's what this guide is about. Um, there's 30 main species, and then there's a lot of things kind of mixed in. So we have like a whole category on deadly plants. And oh, there's wow. a lot, lot of different those. And we have one on deadly mushrooms. 
Um, but then we have like, what do you do with a black bear versus a brown bear versus a polar bear? You know, what do you, what do, you do if a rhino starts to charge you? And I, I wanted to make, the reason it has the book, it's not trying to kill you, is just to point out that most of the time these animals are living in their own habitat. They have their own behaviors and they really, most of the time want, it, it, humans are not on their brain for most animals. Yeah. They're not trying to kill you. Oftentimes they can kill you, but it's not because of ill intent. You know, a lot of people have this idea that nature's out to kill you, yeah. which nature can kill you. But like, I really think that viewing it that way is a slight, it's slightly problematic for the world that we live in. Mm. Back in the day, maybe it's nice to see yourself as an adversary to nature because it keeps you alive. But nowadays, I think uh, that that's, potentially a harmful way of looking at things um and you're better off just understanding the biology of the animals and trying to figure out how can how can you survive by understanding their biology like let me just give you one example and this is interesting wolves mm. wolves are in almost every fairy tale as the bad villain right you you, you never see a wolf as the good guy it's just kind of part of the nature of it um and all of these fairy tales and legends that we have come from Europe, mostly. Now, this is me talking from North America. You're still in Europe. But uh, I don't, do you guys consider yourself part of Europe over there in Ireland? <laughs> I'm not part of Northern Ireland, first of all. I'm Republic of Ireland. Uh, yeah, no, we're, 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 we're Europe. We're part of the EU, everything. Okay, okay. Uh, this is me not knowing a whole lot about all that area. But, That's okay. Uh, you guys just thought of it as, as that. But wolves are quite different in Europe than they are in North America. Mm. And people don't realize that. So they're, I, I document this in the book, but there are about 7,000 documented deaths from wolves in France alone from the year 1200 to about 1920 when they went basically extinct from France. Yeah, that's a lot, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it makes a little bit of sense why there were so many legends and basically stories about how to avoid wolves mm. in Europe. Because... They can be a little bit aggressive, and in theory, they've evolved with humans for a large part of their their uh, existence. Whereas in North America, you know, according to what we know so far, maybe only had thirteen thousand years with humans, mm. right? Yeah. And what that means is that as a dominant predator, they they haven't had a lot of time to have another predator to like deal with. You know, do we eat the human? Do you avoid the human? So like North American, in North American culture or uh, like Native American culture, there's almost no legends of evil wolves. It's just not a thing. They don't have wolves as these bad characters because the wolves in North America are pretty skittish and they avoid people. Like there's a few very rare incidents of wolves attacking people. But um, more, more or less the wolves in North America are a little different than the European wolves. So if you understand that biology, like the, the history of the two, then you can piece out what you should do if there's a wolf around, for instance. Yeah. I, follow, I follow this guy on, uh, on TikTok, and I think his whole thing is he owns a pack of wolves as mm -hmm. pets. Like, he lives with them. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. And they're, like, they're just like dogs. Well, they are like, it's, they're the same, pretty much yeah. the same. Yeah, and I think the difference with uh, wolves, well, well, I mean, dogs and wolves are the same species, right? Yeah. But, um, Wolves are way more pack oriented than most yeah. dogs, which is and uh, which can be a little bit tricky because you're always dealing with dominance issues. Yeah, yeah. Whereas you know my dog, he's so subordinate; <laughs> he just wants to do whatever <laughs> pleases me, which is how we bred these dogs. Basically, mm. bred dogs in general. You kick out the ones that are going to want to attack you. Don't breed them. <laughs> but wolves, the opposite. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I've never actually. I've never actually spent time with wolves other than uh seeing them i work with zoos and stuff so you know see them from afar um and you know see them through binoculars and spotting scopes and stuff. i'd love to, i'd love to get a little more close to wolf it sounds really cool well i like the idea of the book because when you said what to do when a rhino runs towards you i say run mm -hmm. that's probably maybe not the best thing to do i don't know but i like the way you teach people well you um, don't you don't stay still 
<laughs> oh, well, you, I'd yeah. hope not. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's interesting because, like, with rhinos, they, they're herbivores, mm. and you just, they just want you out of their space. Oh. So it, it, what a, a good trick is, is if you dodge, dodge them the first time and run the opposite way, they don't turn and keep following you. You know, they might continue following you in one direction for a long time, but if you can get around them, they'll stop. But, in, but like, as an example, another herbivore slash omnivore is the pig, wild boars. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have wild boars over there? I'm not sure. Uh... A lot of Europe is getting overrun by wild boars, but, like, particularly mainland like mm -hmm. Germany, they're, they have a lot of boar, wild boar problems. But um, if, a boar, if, a, if a pig attacks you, you have to keep – you don't run because they'll keep chasing you. You attack. You, like, keep fighting. Huh. And make sure that they don't knock you down because okay. then your stomach's exposed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, great place to end it, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to get into the whole pigs eating us kind of, you know. <laughs> I presume that's what happens, right? Like. Yeah, well, pigs, people don't realize pigs are freaking gnarly animals. You know, they're, they are um, omnivores. So they're, they're kind of this weird hybrid. Like a lot of times they'll just eat grain, corn, whatever you feed them, but they'll eat meat too. Like they'll eat anything they can get. And it's not like they're going out as a carnivore to attack things, but they're just opportunistic. So if you're, and they get big, you know, the largest pig, uh, I forget the exact number. It's, it's close to a thousand pounds, which is huge right i mean that's that's a big pig and they have these tusks I'll show you this is a, this is just this is a normal pig like these are the lower incisors for yeah. the uh, canines those things like i mean they get much bigger than these but, like those things like jabbing at you you know because they stick out when the jaws shut so as their head is like swinging at you a thousand pound animal with basically daggers as teeth you know sticking out of their mouth yeah you know and down it down at like your you know w below your waist if they hit you in your one of your arteries and they slash your, you're, you're screwed and then you're oh, yeah. knocked down so there are a few incidents of pigs that have for some reason attacked people and then they're alone and then they just continue to eat them afterward. But it, you know, you know, I don't think you have to worry so much about that. It's it's nice to know how to defend yourself or what tactics to do. But um, more or less, pigs just bumping into a pig is probably not a problem. Just don't like attack them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, smart, smart, <laughs> smart. I love yeah. that. Anyway, Rob, I think I've yeah. taken plenty of time. If people would like to follow you, keep up with what you're doing, where would they be able to find you? Um, I think probably the best place is Stone Age Man on YouTube, but I'm also on Instagram as Untamed Science. Um, on Twitter as Untamed Science. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah. I want to thank you for coming on today. This has been great. We'll definitely have to do it again sometime. Well, I'm happy to chat. If you, uh, if anything ever happens, like for instance, somebody gets attacked, then then call me up. We should chat. Like, do you, did you see the cougar video? That cougar, cougar, in the U.S. that followed that guy for six minutes. It was like no. a viral. You didn't see that. Oh uh, Christ, no. You look it up. Yeah, it was a, it was a guy stumbled upon some cougar babies, and then the cougar turned and like kept following him for six minutes. Yes, it's all the videos, and it, it kept like lunging at him. Um, but we can, you know, if something like that happens, then you should call me out. I should Shut definitely, up. if I'm ever being chased by a cougar, be... you're like the number one guy in my phone book. Yeah. <laughs> God. <laughs> well, sometimes it's just fun to talk about because people either think the cougar is just escorting you away kindly, which isn't true, or they think it's attacking <laughs> you, which also isn't really true. Yeah. So it's just nice to kind of talk about what's actually happening. Awesome. Well, so if yeah. you made it this far, thanks for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, tell your grandma about the podcast and, you know, take it handy. <laughs>